Well, we all work so hard in our daily lives, making sure everybody gets everywhere that they need to be on time. And you know, many of us are have jobs outside the home. We take care of the home. We take care of our children. And and frequently, frequently we have days. I, I think you can relate to this, where you feel like you know everything's ruined. <laughs> uh, you you you've experienced times where you clean your floors after so you know so many months of whatever <laughs> and you only have a few moments to enjoy that nice clean floor before the kids come home from school and the dog runs in the house and you're like all right <laughs> my floor is ruined <laughs> i got a new car a couple of a year and a half ago and no joke within two weeks I had a scratch and I had two dings from doors opening. I was like, oh, my new paint job, my new car, my new paint job ruined. <laughs> my, uh, I, I think you can all relate to this too. Like you get your schedule set for the day and, and you know where you have to be at what time and blah, blah, blah. And your kids come in and say, so mom, <laughs> just know that this is not going to end well. Your schedule, blown to pieces, right? Uh, Amber did her 100 day project and she, um, she, you have to take 100 items and make a little collage thing and she, uh, she took Skittles and she took so much time taking all the yellow ones out and she made this beautiful little sun and glued all the Skittles on to make a sun and then she made a rainbow and, and we had to have grass and so we took all the green Skittles and we put them all along the bottom and she was so proud and pleased with her project. She brought it to school, she brought it home, she's like, and they were glued on. Half the Skittles were gone. She's like, Mommy, the kids ate all the Skittles. My project is ruined. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I mean, we do have times in our lives where things get ruined. We had a macro burst a couple years ago. I mean, you guys remember. We were trying to get home until 1.30 in the morning, Jeff and I, and driving around. We, we saw, you know, cars that had wind, holes in windshields that were still driving and, and, and cars lined up along the roads that had been abandoned and, and, and trees that crushed cars and trees that crushed houses. And it was like something out of the apocalypse. I will never forget that. I mean, people had their lives. I mean, people had their houses ruined, their cars ruined. It was scary. It was so scary. Um, my poor brother-in-law, he's a trader. And... Uh, so the computers are now taking over what he does, and um, the computers are allowed to do uh, things that are illegal that people wouldn't be allowed to do, but the people that program the computers that benefit financially from the computers doing illegal trades are, it's okay, I guess, apparently. And so my brother-in-law, every year, he's facing a career that will be ruined. At some point, he will be ruined. Um, and we all have no, either have experienced or have close uh, loved ones who have experienced relationships with spouses or you know other close family friends that that have experienced relationship ruins and it's it's very hard and it's very difficult and um, we feel some of our relationships are hopeless and sometimes we feel guilt and we carry the shame um, and sometimes we turn that out and we blame um, sometimes we blame God, and it's 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 hard. We 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 have real ruins that happen in our lives. Well, we find Zechariah in the midst of a type of ruins. I mean, you know, Jerusalem had been ruined, and our prophet today, Zechariah, he like our prophet Haggai from that we talked about last week. Zechariah had been called by God to motivate the people, to encourage them to get back to the work of rebuilding and restoring the temple that had been ruined. And God uh, does it in a different way than Haggai. God gives Zechariah eight visions, five visions to encourage and eight visions to warn um, as a way to motivate the people. And Zechariah was to take these visions to the people. And what, when we, we start out, though, in the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, um, it's very interesting how it starts. Um, we see that the word of the Lord comes to Zechariah, um, and verse, jump down to verse 3. God said, the Lord Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. I mean, right off the bat, we see that a, a really important principle that 
God is way more concerned with the people of Israel, the individual people of Israel, that, that they would turn their hearts to him and they would walk with him in a fellowship. He's way more concerned with his relationship with them, their relationship with him, than with the actual building of the temple. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, and then he says, and then he goes on and he says in verse 4, do not be like your forefathers to whom the earlier prophets proclaimed. This is what the Lord Almighty says, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they would not listen um, and they would not pay attention to me, declares the Lord. But when, where are your forefathers now? So, you know, I think that's another you know, good thing to, to remember that, that God doesn't want us to be stuck in our past. He doesn't want us to dwell on our past. Um, uh, but he does want us to learn from our past, to not repeat the mistakes of our past, either mistakes that we've made or mistakes others, our loved ones have made ahead of us that may have caused harm. So the principle is that in the midst of your ruins, God wants our hearts to be turned to him and be fully surrendered to him. Um, and it's hard because sometimes we have to acknowledge the ruins of our own lives are because of our own selfishness or arrogance or idols and that's really hard to do when he says return i mean that like we talk about a lot it takes a lot of courage to repent it takes a lot of humility um, to admit our own fault and our own wrongdoing and it takes a lot of faith to trust god that he can take the pieces of our shattered lives and make something more beautiful out of them than we could. It takes a lot of faith, but he's the master craftsman. And when you rely on him, his wisdom, his power, his creativity, his sovereignty to weave it all together, he can make something much more beautiful than we could ever do. Uh, right? To him to his able, who was able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, to him be the glory. Uh, right? It's his power. That is at work through us, and that's Ephesians 3.20. It's a promise. So God gives five visions. I'm going to run through them uh, quickly. We can talk, to talk about them more in more detail in our discussion if you want to drill down on one or, or talk about all of them. Um, but as we go through these, I want for the five um, visions of encouragement, I want you to see God's pity. I want you to see God's protection. I want you to see God's purposes. I want you to see God's purification and his power. Okay, so we're going to pull those out. Okay, so we're going to uh, chapter one. Um, the first, um, we're still in chapter one. The first vision that God gives Zechariah is a man that is uh, sitting on a horse that is standing among the myrtle trees and there's horses behind him. And um, the man uh, then explains that, it, that the Lord has sent him to go out through the earth and, um, and, the, and it says, verse 12, the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judea, which you have been angry with for these 70 years? So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Okay, so God says, proclaim this. The Lord Almighty says, I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. I am, I am angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but added to the calamity. Okay, jump down. Um, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt. Proclaim further. My towns again will overflow with prosperity. The Lord will comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. So we see that, you know, God, this is a promise for, Jew, for Israel that God loves her, that God has incredible mercy on her, on, on the people. It looks like God had been angry with her for seven years, but God will return to them. His presence will be restored to them. And uh, he promises that prosperity is going to flow again, and they're going to find comfort and peace uh, through this time. Uh, then we, the second vision was the vision of the horns and the four, the four horns and the four craftsmen. This is so interesting. Um, so there are, uh, he explains that the horns that are the ones that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. And then uh, Zechariah asks, what are, you what are these coming to do? So the Lord answers, this is uh, verse 20. 
These are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise his head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns uh, of the nations that lifted up those that scattered Judah and its people. So we know from um, our study of other uh, parts of scripture and from Daniel particularly that a horn, uh, a horn in scripture tends to mean a nation that rises up against God's people. So we know that, um, that, that we're told, I mean, basically God is telling Zechariah to tell the people that yes, these, these nations have risen against you, have scattered you, but God will raise up craftsmen. God will raise up other nations, other leaders, other powers that will come and terrify these nations and overtake them. And um, as I was going through it this morning, I was thinking, well, yeah, I mean, it's that's the obvious, um, the obvious fulfillment of that was, you know, Assyria is no more, Babylon is no more. You know, those were the nations that took Israel away, right? And and uh, and Judah away. But then I thought about it even a step further, like the fact that Israel today exists, surrounded by nations that hate them and want to destroy them. I mean, that in and of itself is evidence proof for the existence of God that that his that that Israel would even be a nation today that it just again just I believe past fulfillment present fulfillment and probably there will be a future fulfillment in this too which we're going to get to the future stuff when we study the second half of Zechariah so hold on to that thought just think about it some more um, the third vision, uh, a man with a measuring line who goes out and he measures Jerusalem to find out how wide and how long it is. Um, and verse 3, then the angel who was speaking to me left and another angel ran to meet him and said, run and tell that young man, Jerusalem will be a city without walls because of the great number of men and livestock in it. And I myself will be a wall of fire around it, declares the Lord, and I will be its glory with within it's so i i i feel like god is saying that he himself will protect jerusalem um because again you know we know that from our past studies that god and i think god's reinforcing this here that he takes personal offense when people when others rise up against his chosen people when others rise up against his people god will protect and god will will promise to fight for them um those that have harmed his people and he will bring his presence to to comfort. Um, and, 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 and you sense this urgency because the one angel was there and then he walked away and the other angel said, no, 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 wait, wait, go back, go back. You feel this urgency like 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 Zechariah's got to understand and communicate to the people that God will protect his people. And not only that, if you keep reading, see, um, see God again, this is just reinforces what we just said. Um, verse eight. Um, for whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. For surely I will raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. Again, you know, somebody offends one of God's children. God is going to rise up and protect his children. Um, he's not going to let that happen. And then jump down. God says, I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. And so I feel like it even goes a little bit beyond God's protection. We see the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be still before the Lord. So uh, that that choosing, that God choosing, you know, I, I feel like it goes beyond even the protection to more like like God we always know he chooses for a purpose, right? God always purposes uh, in, in everything that he does. And I think he's communicating to Zechariah, look, God has purposes for the ruins of Jerusalem. And it, it's okay. Um, God wants them to know that there is a future for them, that there is hope, right? And, 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 and as, you know, this man that's, that's sent to survey the ruins of Jerusalem, that, that in a way, um, you know, God is communicating that there is still a purpose for Jerusalem. God has not abandoned them. He chose them for a reason, that his purposes are huge, are expansive. They go beyond uh, the Jewish community to, to the Gentiles. And we know that that was fulfilled when Jesus came, right? Because the gospel, we know it started in, in Jerusalem and it went out to Judah, Judea, and then Samaria to the ends of the earth, right? We benefit from uh, God's plan 
right? As Gentiles, we, as Gentiles, right? Because the gospel came to us too. So we, and, and what we've been seeing this year uh, in our study of hi, hi, um, the history of Israel and even before, even from God, God's creation, we see God's creation. We see through, we see God's purposes um, coming to fruition in, in, in the life of Jesus. And that everything that God did through creation, through Adam and Eve, through um, you know the rest of Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the 12 tribes going to Egypt, being led out through Moses, the law, the everything that we've been studying, the fe the, the temple, the, the the sacrifices, the feasts, the festivals, the dietary laws, everything that we've been studying in the Old Testament and now the prophets point to Jesus, this time of fulfillment that God is purposing and and so God still has purposes through this these ruins and um, and we're, we're, we're we see uh, God even elaborating on that as we get into chapter three um, he uh, the next vision is God shows him a picture of the high priest Joshua so remember um, when the, the Jews came back from exile to Babylon and they were under the leadership of the governor Zerubbabel um, and then also the high priest uh, Joshua um, so God shows uh, Zechariah an image of the high priest Joshua, and we see Satan standing there accusing Joshua. And God comes to Joshua's rescue. He rebukes Satan. God rebukes Satan. Um, and then it says Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And the angel said to him, take off his dirty clothes. Um, and then... Uh, Let's see, verse four. And then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put rich garments on you. Put on a clean turban. Um, and so they put on a clean turban on his head and clothed him. And the angel of the Lord stood by him. And he said, if you walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and will have charge of my courts and I will give you a place um, among these standing here. And then if you go down to... Uh, okay, so then um, we've got the um, uh, the branch, my servant. I'm sending you the branch, my servant. We know that's Jesus. Um, the stone I've set in front of Joshua, seven eyes on it. Okay, uh, that's. Uh, we'll talk about that discussion. I'm not really sure about that one. Um, and the Lord Almighty said, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. And then in that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under his vine and fig tree declares the Lord Almighty. Well, we know that that this is a beautiful picture of that, that, that we know that our sin makes us filthy and dirty. And so we have this symbolic picture of, of, of Joshua, the high priest, just, you know, being, um, you know, just in filthy clothes and God taking away those filthy clothes and putting on fresh, bright, new, beautifully white uh, garments. And that's really a picture of our salvation, isn't it? Because uh, when we trust in Jesus, um, we, uh, his forgiveness for our sins through his death on the cross, we know that he takes away our sin. It's like we're changing clothes. He takes away our sin and he places upon us his perfect, perfect life, his righteousness, his rightness before God gets placed on us. And so it's all his doing, it's all his righteousness that makes it us right with God. So we know, and we know that because that one day that, G, that God took away the sins of the land in one single day, we know that was the day that Jesus died on the cross. He conquered sin, he conquered death, he conquered Satan, he defeated them. And the vine and the fig tree here, I believe is a symbol of peace and security and comfort that we have now that we are in Christ, right? So, so again, all the promises that we've been been working toward um, and studying the Old Testament. It's so exciting to study the Old Testament because you just see that it's all God's huge plan for humanity and how, think about how much love and, and, and planning and creativity that God put into like this for thousands of years working up to this point and what a privilege that we have to be able to, to look back and see that, see it all fulfilled. Um, not all. Some of it we still have yet to be fulfilled, but to see God's salvation uh, come to fruition. Um, so, so, um, so this is really God purifying us, right? So again, when we trust in him, we trust in his death on the cross, 
um, as uh, forgiveness for our sins. God takes away our sin and he places upon us his clothes of righteousness. Uh, we are uh, before God. Uh, we have uh, Jesus' right standing of God, his righteousness, his rightness with God gets placed on us. So we are then declared right before God. We are declared holy before God. Um, then the, the next vision, uh, chapter 4, is uh, particularly for Zerubbabel. And we know that, um, so this is an interesting one. Again, we can elaborate on it more because I'm going so fast. We can elaborate more on our discussion. Um, this vision is so, um, and again, these visions, again, are given all in one night. So <clears throat> Zechariah must have been totally overwhelmed. Um, God gives him this vision. He asks him, what do you see? And Zechariah answers, I see a gold lamp, a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top, seven lights on it, seven channels of lights, two olive trees, one on each side of it, of the bowl. And um, God says, uh, and so Zachariah says, what are these? And, and, and God says, um, verse six, for he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Um, and so, and then if you, you know, go on and read to the end of uh, chapter 4, we're, we're told a little bit more of the explanation um, of this vision. Uh, but we, we think about Zerubbabel, you know, he, and we think about last week's study, that he had been uh, really struggling, right, with opposition, right? We, he was um, facing um, uh, lies, false accusations. Um, he was facing, um, we know, um, maybe like a, uh, an apathy in the people, uh, fear, right? Um, fear from the people, um, maybe some, some laziness, right? And we know that they had stopped working. Um, and Zerubbabel was probably very, very frustrated and very discouraged because he knew that God had given him that job to finish the temple. Um, and so God says to him, it's not gonna be by your power, Zerubbabel that you're going to finish the temple. You are going to finish the temple, but it's not going to be your work. It's going to be my work through you. Um, and, um, and so as I looked a little bit closer at this, um, and I was kind of like looking at my, my Bible notes because I didn't, know, didn't really understand. Um, um, my, my Bible says that the light from the lamp um, represents the reflection of God's glory as the people uh, do the work that God has um, sent them to do. But I kind of looked at it, and we can talk about this more in discussion. I kind of look at it like, well, the, that that it's almost like all three members of the Trinity are at work here, because we know that the Lord Almighty is giving, uh, uh, God the Father seems to be giving the visions to um, Zechariah, and when I think of the light, I think of Jesus as the light of the world, and He's in the middle of this. So we know Jesus. We know that He is in the the middle of everything, and then the two olive branches, one on each side, uh, we're told um, as we go on are, you know, one is uh, Zerubbabel and one is um, Zachariah, um, uh, the, uh, the priest Joshua, um, right? But there's the oil that's flowing, and we know that um, that oil uh, is symbolic in the Bible as the Holy Spirit. So we see the third person of the Trinity at work. And so again, it just goes back to what we have always, what we like to say a lot is that it really is, you know, that the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us um, is that oil that flows and, 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 and gives um, the perspective and the power and the presence of God that we need to complete the works that God has given to us. So the principle here is that only God has the power to restore life in ruins. Um, so as we turn to him, as we trust him, as we walk by faith, right, and we, as we receive his cleanliness, right, he will rebuild uh, the ruins in our lives. And sometimes it's one stone at a time, you know, sometimes it's hard. But we know that he'll do a better job than we will. He promises it's his power that's going to be doing it through us, right? That's another promise. There's nothing that's ruined in eternity, right? God will make all things good, all things beautiful in his time. And it'll be his power. So while these visions were given to, these five visions of encouragement were given to Zechariah to encourage the people of Jerusalem, they are also 
true and good for us, that we can find great, great comfort in these as well, right? Because we know, right? You know that, that God has chosen you and he loves you and he's poured out incredible mercy on you. We know his mercy is limitless, right? Knows no, no, no bounds. His love and grace for us knows no bounds, right? He has purposes in us, even in our ruins, sometimes more through our ruins, right? God has plans that will prosper us, not harm us, right? Um, as we walk now in the power of the Holy Spirit, you walk with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God has a plan for your life. And we need to look beyond. We need to look beyond the circumstances of our lives and the things that, that drag us down and the, the ruins of our, of our lives. And we need to see God's eternal purposes through them, right? He's with you. He has he will fight for you. He will protect you, um, right? The, those two verses that I said last week, I that came to my mind again this week, right? No weapon formed against you will prosper. If God is for you, who can be against you? That's uh, Isaiah 54, I can't, didn't write the verse down, um, and Romans 8, 31. It's so hard, and sometimes it's so hard to turn and trust God, right? Because it does, it takes a lot of courage, it takes a lot of humility, and it takes a lot of faith. To, to trust God with the ruins of your life. But, 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 you, but we walk by faith and we trust God. We trust his promises to us. We, we stand in his promises. We know when we, when, we, when we claim his promises, we will find mercy in our time of need, right? We know all these promises. He will protect us. He will fight for us. Um, and you'll experience power as you walk through those purposes that God has for you. Um, you know, like with, with our son Joel, like when he was born and he was born so broken and very disabled, um, it was really hard. It was really hard every day to walk by faith, right? Knowing that, you know, really choosing to believe not what I felt, but what I knew to be true, that God was doing more through Joel's brokenness than through his wholeness than he could have done if Joel was whole. And though, although, you know, he was so broken physically, we knew his soul was whole because he had that relationship with God. And um, and in a strange way, you know, now I know he's whole, but every day now is a struggle to walk by faith knowing that I will see him whole someday. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard, it takes a lot of faith to stand on those promises um, because there is a hole in our hearts. <laughs> we miss him, there's a hole in our family, there's a hole in our lives. And I know that's a whole lot of holes. <laughs> to deal with but God's promises are true and they will come true and for those that 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 trust him know that he provides healing and wholeness to all who put their hope in him and you will experience that you know but we also you know we also know what it's like to walk through the the ruins of a, of a broken career and to rebuild after a career. And, 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 I, and we had to fight, every day was a fight, even to get out of bed sometimes, to choose not to, to do the blame game and to get ground down in the who did what to who at what time and what we could have done and what we should have done. And you know, you kind of get wrapped up and you give a lot of real estate in your brain and a lot of energy to, 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 to rehashing. And, and, and we had to set that aside and we had to, to, to say, to, to walk by faith and trust that God had something better for us. And it was hard because it was three years of Jeff going to school full-time, working full-time, balancing family life with all of the responsibilities that he had. And um, so many times we claimed that promise in the book of Joel that we have already gone through several weeks ago. We, we talked about that one promise the, a lot, that God will repay the years that the locusts have eaten. And we weren't talking, you know, money. That was a whole other thing. But, but, but we have seen him do that, that 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 Jeff is that it was a hard and, it, and, it, and at the time it felt a harsh way to move us out of uh, of what we thought we were supposed to be doing but then to know now looking back at it that God you know that he had purposes that went way beyond what we could we experienced and and and, and now looking back like oh my goodness you know like that 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 we have what a privilege it is that we uh, are able to uh, provide people with hope and healing and wholeness and um, we both, Jeff and I, feel like this is what our created purpose was, that this is what God created us to do, and that's a huge blessing. It's huge. It goes way beyond money, that, that, that to be blessed, that knowing that, you know, your career, like what you do for a living is, is, is um, it gives you so much fulfillment, is such a, a blessing, and you love it. And that's why our logo is the phoenix, right? Out of the ashes, 
rise new hopes, new dreams, uh, joy, right? Um, when we give the pieces of our ruined lives to God, he can make something more beautiful than we can ever ask or imagine. So we have these uh, five uh, visions of, of encouragement. We also have three visions of, of judgment. And you guys have persevered with me through a lot of judgment this year. So again, I'm going to go really fast for the sake of time. And these were some crazy, creepy visions. <laughs> so you saw the woman in the basket. That was a little creepy. Um, <laughs> but um, so we have, we have, so um, we have uh, these visions of, of coming judgment. Again, these are future for Zachariah, but I believe they're future for us too. And when we circle back around and, and, and finish the rest of Zechariah, I think it'll all make sense why. Um, so um, we have this flying scroll. And, um, you know, when I think of scroll, I think of um, like back in the colonial days, the guys with the white wigs would come out and they'd unwrap the, roll, the scroll and make an announcement, a public announcement. Um, but this was a flying scroll and it was a lot much bigger than this. Um, it, and and, and it, again, these are the days, I was kind of thinking about this, how crazy that would be, because they are, this is the days before planes, so something flying in the sky would have been uh, unmistakable, like everybody would know about it. So to me, the flying scroll um, says that this is something that pertains to everybody, everybody, this is an announcement that's made. Um, we're actually told that the scroll represents the curse that is going out through the whole land. Um, and again, the, the, I think the woman in the basket um, we're told it's the iniquity of the people throughout the whole land. So we see that that in these two um, visions, that 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 curse. Again, I believe that's the curse. That's the the condemnation that we are under. It's the penalty for our sin. It's the death penalty that we are under, and it it goes out to everybody. And if you were able to uh, read the uh, the verses that I put in the homework, you'll see that that Paul reinforces that in the New Testament in the passages that we had in our homework that Jesus be came the curse for us when he died on the cross he actually became the curse for us he took our place he took that death penalty that we deserved um, in our place so when we trust in jesus right that is god's prescribed um payment for our sin remedy for our sin that we escape god's coming judgment and his coming condemnation because it's through christ's death on the cross right he takes away our sin and he clothes us with Jesus' perfection. Um, not that we are perfect. We still sin, but we are being made more perfect. And when we see Jesus face to face, that's when we will be actually made perfect. Um, but at this point, when we, the moment you trust Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you are declared perfect positionally before God. So, um, so, how do, so again, how uh, he goes on. Um, oh, and then there's another ver vision again of the four chariots. And I think that, again, reinforces that judgment's coming. It will be inescapable. It will be go out throughout the whole land, um, right? So get ready. Get your heart ready. Um, and he goes on in chapter 6 to tell us how with the crowning of Joshua. Okay, so the eight visions were given in one night. Say, Zachariah, it's not like Zachariah was asleep. He wasn't given his, the God just gave these to him. He was fully aware. He's fully conscious of it. He was to um, <clears throat> preach these visions to the people, which he did. And then God told Zechariah to go to Joshua, the high priest, and crown him king. And, um, and then uh, verse 12 of chapter 6. Tell, this is, tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man. Interesting. Here is the man. Those are the exact words that Pilate used. That's just a side note to announce the beaten Jesus. Here's your king. When he said, here is the man. It's kind of wild. Did Pilate realize he was fulfilling prophecy? No, probably not. Here is the man whose name is the branch. Jesus is the branch. He will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne and he will be priest on his throne and there will be harmony between the two. Now, when this was happening to Joshua, when Zechariah was, was putting this on him and speaking these words, Joshua was probably freaking out because like we learned this year, the role of the king, the king was not to perform the duties of the high priest. 
The high priest was not to perform the duties of the king. The two were not supposed to cross. And where there was crossing, there was punishment for. Remember, Uzziah tried to do this and he got leprosy. So this was a big no-no. And so Zachariah, so Zachariah uh, crowning the high priest king would have been crazy. But this, again, we know was foreshadowing of Jesus, right? That Jesus would be both the high priest and the king, the reigning king. Hebrews 7, 25 to 27 says, so about Jesus, therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he is always lives to intercede for them. Isn't that awesome? Jesus can save us. Jesus will save us completely. That's a promise. And he lives, he intercedes. He prays for us all the time, Jesus does. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart for sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices for, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. So Jesus didn't have to sacrifice for himself because he had no sin. That's why his death on the cross is sufficient to take away our sins and acceptable to God to take away our sins because his life was perfect. He was morally perfect. He was religiously perfect before God. Um, and then chapter 9 of Hebrews, verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Jesus, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse us from our consciousness from acts that lead to sin and death, so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator. He is our high priest. Jesus is our high priest. He's our priest of the new covenant. Um, uh, who may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom. So Jesus died as a ransom to set us free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Um, so Jesus died as a ransom. He paid that penalty on the cross for us. Verse 28, so Jesus was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So he's our high priest he made the sacrifice uh, to make us right with God. He's our mediator. He intercedes for us. He performs all the priestly duties for us, but he also will return as the reigning king. Um, so I was going to read Revelation 19, 11 to 16, but you can read it on your own. We're going to get more into Revelation as we come circle back around to Zechariah. Uh, but this is a picture of Jesus returning for the second time as the reigning king. He's going to come back on his horse. Um, and we know he's king, but... When he returns for a second time, everybody's going to know that he is king, that his kingship will be fully realized and fully consummated um, at that moment, his kingdom will be. And then we, for Zechariah um, chapter seven, 7 and 8, um, it really, just as a summary, it really is a reminder that God is way more concerned with our heart with him than, it, than, our, than what we do for him, right? God is more concerned about our being experiencing his presence as opposed to you know what we do for god but how we live like he says is very very important so god is saying that you know it out of a right relationship with him um we should live rightly right we should be good we should be just and merciful and compassionate right um and they should flow out of a heart that's right with him um, so, so when we do things like, you know, we celebrate the holidays, we celebrate Christmas and Easter, you know, we, we don't want to make it about, you know, about us or glorifying us, you know, we want to be making it about, about God, honoring God and glorifying him for what he's done for us, right? When we go to church, you know, we, we, sometimes we go to church out of obedience and, you know, it's good to obey, but God wants our hearts to go to church to be, uh, you know, to be worshiping with our brothers and sisters as a, is it, as a picture, as an image, as a taste of what's to come when we are all around the throne uh, worshiping God together. Um, so, um, so again, so, so God wants true religion, which is really a relationship with him, but out of that relationship with him, you know, works will flow. Um, and we will do these works of service for God and uh, we will be obedient um, because of our love for him. Um, not that we're trying to, to earn our position with him because he's already given us that position, um, but we do it out of our love for him, out of a heart that's uh, um, grateful for what he's done. And so um, just to summarize these chapters also, another principle is obedience brings blessing, right? Disobedience brings judgment. 
And again, obedience is hard and sometimes it's tough uh, to obey, um, but we always find you know, the blessings of peace and joy and happiness when we do obey God, um, even when it's hard. And then so, so Zechariah chapters one through eight, we see visions to encourage us, um, visions to warn us. Um, also, we see um, the way that we escape that coming judgment is to put our trust in uh, the high priest, who is also the king, you know, the Messiah, the coming Messiah. For them, it was the coming Messiah, it was the future Messiah. You know, we can look back and see that that, that Messiah is Jesus. Um, and that we see that when once we have that relationship, that right relationship with God, um, that right living will flow uh, from a heart that's right with the Lord and that will bring those, that's the key to, uh, to being happy and feeling fulfilled in life is that, that, that obedience and having that right relationship with Jesus. Um, amen. Amen. Amen.